Hi, I'm Daniela and this is Jocelyn. Thanks for coming back to our channel. In this video, we're going to share our new life with multiples. We've been so excited to update you on everything that's been going on since the triplets have been born, but as you can imagine, our hands have been a little full. <laughs> We thought it was essential to devote all of our attention to adjusting to becoming a family of six. So now that we have our sea legs in that department, we are excited to share a little bit more about what's been going on with us. In this video, we're going to share our labor and delivery story, our transition back home, some things we didn't expect, and where we are now. In this video, we have two babies sleeping in the cribs behind us and one in the swing. So you may hear a little bit of baby background noise. Bear with us. So let's jump right into our experience with labor and delivery. It started off as any other day I was working. I work from home and at this point in my pregnancy, my legs were so swollen. I had to work from the recliner with my legs elevated in the nursery. So I was working from home and my doctor called me and they said, we forgot there's a routine test that's usually done at like 36 weeks, but since you're delivering at 36 weeks, you should come in today and we can do it. And I was like, ugh, okay. I really was frustrated about going to the doctor this day because my legs were swollen, it was hard to walk, and then I had to like leave work a little earlier. So I pushed it off as far as I could and took the latest appointment, which was 2.30. At two o'clock, I got up, was like, all right, I gotta get ready to leave. I went to the bathroom, and at this point, I was like, uh-oh. And then I was like, Jocelyn, come here, I think my water broke. And she's like, no, it didn't. You thought your water broke before? And I'm like, no, I really think it did this time. The last time that happened, Bella came with us to the hospital, and that was like a whole debacle because she was underage, so they wouldn't let her come back in the room with me. Um, so Jocelyn had to wait in the waiting room with her until she could get picked up. And the hospital was like 40 minutes away. so. This time she was like all dressed and ready, like I'm coming to the doctor with you guys. And I was like, actually don't because I think my water just broke and she was really upset. And in the car ride there, I started feeling some contractions and I was like, ooh, this feels different than the Braxton Hicks I've been having, but I'm just like playing it cool. Jocelyn was like, I don't think it's time. And I was like, uh, I think it might be time. We got to the doctor and they just checked me in and they were like, oh, any fluid or contractions? I was like, well, there wasn't any until the car ride here. And they were like, oh, okay. So they tested the fluid and it did come back as amniotic fluid. They were like, you need to go right over to the labor and delivery, your water's broken. We got to the hospital around 3 p.m. and luckily we already had Daniela's hospital bag packed in the car for a few weeks before this. So we could just go straight from the doctor's office to the hospital where we were checked in and they confirmed again that Daniela's water did break. Because I had lunch around noon, they said they had to wait a couple hours before we could do my C-section. So at this point, they're like, you're gonna hang out here until about eight or nine. My initial thoughts were a little bit of worry because I wanted to make it to 36 weeks. I was only 34 weeks and three days. But in my mind, I knew that the average was 32 weeks and I told myself like, if I make it 34 to 35, I'll still be happy. So I felt pretty accomplished, although I was still nervous that we made it as far as we did. During that time, we were filling our parents in on what was happening. We asked my dad to bring uh, my overnight bag and anything else from the house we could think of that we might need. Daniela was hooked up to a fetal monitor to make sure that all the baby's heart rates were good and no one was in distress the entire time. And we were also just deliberating on names and waiting with anticipation to meet our babies. Although I didn't have really severe contractions, I did start to get really severely nauseous. Um, they told me that was due to like the surge of hormones that I was experiencing. The most difficult part of my delivery was definitely the nausea. <laughs> Around 8.45, Daniela was rolled into the operating room where I had to wait right outside until they prepped her. They gave her a spinal block and prepped her for surgery. And once she was all ready and the curtain was up and right before they were about to cut her open is when I got to come back and sit with her and get ready for our babies to be born. 
Yeah, it was like right as they were cutting me because like they were like, all right, we're gonna start. And I was like, Jocelyn's not here. And I turned my head and you were walking in the door. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, it was very exciting and nerve wracking to be awake and experiencing all of this. But I was, I was really, really nervous, but also really, really excited. One of the coolest things was that our baby A, B, and C stayed baby A, B, and C as they were being born. So for those pregnant with multiples, you are assigned A, B, and C right away when you find out you're having multiples. But then once you're cut open, whatever baby comes out first is A and B and so on. So there's a good chance that things can get mixed up. Who you thought was A might not be A after delivery, which I was like obsessed with them not mixing it up. And I talked to the doctor ahead of time and I was like, A's right here, C's right here, and B's right here. And they were like, okay, okay. Um, and because A was like right where they cut me open, she came out first and she stayed A and then they followed suit. Although we couldn't see anything, we did hear little baby A, Willow, cry first. And her cry was so like tiny and little. It still is. She wound up needing some oxygen to help her lungs adjust to the outside world and weighed four pounds, four ounces. The thing that was most nerve-wracking for me is that she was born and then they like whisked her away into this other part of the OR to like work on her so we didn't really get to see her right away. And then like other babies just started coming so there's just like a lot going on at once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happened really quick. Baby A was born at 9.06 and then it was like just minutes. So then at, what was it, two minutes later, 9.08, they said, oh, baby B is here and he's bald. <laughs> And then that's when Juniper was born. And his lungs were a lot stronger. You could tell right away. Like His cry was like big and loud. And he wound up weighing 5 pounds, 12 ounces, and needing no oxygen or extra support. And then another two minutes passed by. And it was 9.10, and baby C came out. And that was Eden. She waited a second before she cried. Just me and Jocelyn were like, cry, cry, cry. Holding and our then, breath, I know. And then she was like, and we were so excited and they said oh your baby c is here she's doing great they moved her away and she also did need a little bit of oxygen as well she wound up weighing five pounds three ounces then they stabilized them all in the or and brought jocelyn over to cut the cord the first time of really like meeting the babies and there's just so many nurses and people going all over it was like stimulation overload of course i was really worried about baby A and C because they were getting oxygen and stuff like that. After Jocelyn cut the cords, they brought all the babies over and took a picture with all of us, which was so cute. The babies got taken away to the NICU and they said Jocelyn can come with them. We discussed beforehand as a part of our plan that if they would allow Joss to go with them, then I wanted her to. So she could be there when they assessed, took vitals, got them set up in, in the NICU placed IV catheters, all that, I wanted her there with them. So she was apprehensive to leave me, but I felt better that somebody was there to advocate for the babies because I was awake, I could advocate for myself in surgery. And right away, each baby had a team of nurses working on them. And my attention was definitely divided in all these different places with each of the babies. And then I'm constantly thinking about Daniela, like I hope her surgery is going well. So once I went into recovery, um, I was shaking a lot, which they said was a side effect of the anesthesia. Um, I was shaking a ton, but that was really my only complication at this point. They um, helped me recover, and then they allowed my mom and Bella to come back and be with me while I was waking up so I wasn't alone. And as soon as I was recovered enough, they were going to bring me up to the NICU in my bed to see the babies. They eventually did wheel me up once I was stable enough. And as soon as we got to the NICU, I started vomiting. I had nausea throughout the entire labor and delivery and that's when it came. I was just puking my guts out right in front of the NICU. So when I got in to see the babies, it was really difficult to actually like see them and allow myself to like look at them and be happy and excited because I was like so scared that I was gonna puke on them. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they took me back to my room where I had a really long night of vomiting almost the entire night. So Daniela spent four days in the hospital recovering from her C-section and a lot of that time was spent going back and forth between her hospital room and the NICU. 
we were fortunate enough to have all three babies in the same NICU room, which was really helpful when seeing them all. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk more about our whole NICU experience in an, another video, so stay tuned for that, especially if you're expecting multiples or are anticipating a NICU stay. We're going to talk about our experience and some things you should expect or things that we didn't really think of that were really helpful to know. Our transition home was surprisingly fast. Um, having multiples, I was prepared for potentially a long NICU stay, but our longest NICU stay was 10 days, and that was A, Baby Willow. At day six, Juniper came home. At day eight, Eden came home. And at day 10, Willow came home. Although I think it was really hard leaving the babies in the NICU while Daniela was to recover back at home, I think the silver lining was that we kind of had some time to acclimate to getting used to having babies at home one at a time. So like every two days another baby would come home. So we'd have like two days with Ju just Junie and then two days with Junie and Eden. And then after that, all three of them were home. Luckily the NICU had a routine that we just kind of were trying to stick to once we got home, but it was definitely a lot. <laughs> yeah, our first night home with Junie, I think for me was hardest because I was like a nervous wreck like okay is it too cold in here is he okay is he eating enough like you think about like all these things constantly when Eden came home I felt a little bit more comfortable with the babies and having them at home so although it was a little harder to adjust to feeding two in the middle of the night and changing two and making sure they're both okay um, I felt a little more confident and for me, I think the hardest night was having all three of them home because I've had experience having one newborn home with me, so I wasn't too nerve-wracked. Like, one, got it. Two, okay, there's two of us, so, like, we can tag team it. Okay. Three is, like, there's always one going unaccounted for, so, like, how do we juggle our time, which was a little bit, you know, kind of tricky to figure out at first just because we were used to having a team of nurses with us at all times. Yeah. After the first night, I think we kind of came up with a little system, which then we've tweaked and edited and improved <laughs> since then. Um, I feel like every three days or a week, we would like figure out something that worked a little better. But the quick and short of it is that sleep is hard to come by with three. People have trouble sleeping with one baby. So you can imagine with three babies, you have to think they're eating every three hours. As soon as you feed them, like the bottle goes in their mouth, that's when your timer starts. So if we're feeding them at 9 p.m. in three hours, we need to feed them again. By the time we feed and change each one, we probably can get back to sleep for an hour. If we were lucky in the beginning, an hour and a half. So that really did not leave room for much sleep. I think in the beginning few weeks, we would wake up in the morning and only have had like three or four hours of broken sleep. Getting three hours of sleep in one hour increments is a whole other level of sleep deprivation that I was not familiar with. <laughs> um, I will have to say the first like four to six weeks are still a little bit of a blur because of that. Luckily, both of our moms were a huge help during that time. Even if they weren't helping with feeding, they could really help us with the housework and other things that we needed to do that fell to the wayside because we were just trying to stay afloat. It's hard with pumping because you have to pump right after you feed them or during. I'd say the last two weeks we finally are becoming a little bit more alive because we're getting a little bit more sleep now that they're almost three months old. Something I did not expect was to have such a quick short NICU stay. I know we mentioned that baby A and C were on oxygen, but they were only on oxygen for a very short period of time. By the morning when I went to visit them, their CPAPs were off and they were no longer on oxygen. So that was really great news. All the babies did surprisingly well and everyone was really, really impressed with their weights, how well they were doing, and how long I carried them. One thing we were warned about that I didn't really expect was how hard it was having some babies in the NICU and some babies home with us because once the baby's released from the NICU, they can't go back to visit siblings usually. So we had to divide and conquer. Daniela would take the morning shift home to try to sleep a little bit more and stay with the babies that were home while I'd go visit the baby at the NICU and then we'd switch off around lunchtime so this way we were both getting to see everyone. 
that was really tough. Although we kind of knew the likelihood of all three of them being released at the same time was really slim. It was harder than I expected for sure. I'm not gonna lie, like I was a nervous wreck. I was a nervous wreck to be home alone with two babies or one baby at the time. I was a nervous wreck to be at the NICU without Jocelyn. I really wanted us to be together so we could make like all informed decisions together and handle the care of the babies together. But it turned out okay. I just needed a little pep talk and encouragement. And this is when it was really helpful that both of our moms were here. Another thing I didn't expect was our minivan to be back ordered. <laughs> so even though the babies were being released in increments, days apart, our first and second doctor's appointment with all three of them was so difficult because we had to get two different cars and figure out how to get there and it was just was so much more work than it would have been if we had our minivan when we were supposed to. It was scheduled to come in August 10th and as you know babies were born on the 3rd. It wouldn't have been a problem for if it came in on the 10th but it actually didn't come in until like September, September. 25th. Another thing I didn't expect was even though the babies were used to having like the schedule from the NICU, all bets were off once we got them home. So we had it planned where Junie would eat like an hour before the girls and this way we could pace them out. That quickly changed where our littlest was ready to catch up to her brother and sister by eating more and more frequently. So she like jumped the line and we were feeding her first and then we kind of just waited to see, okay, who's starting the feeding train and then we'll just go from there. Whoever woke up first would get fed first. And then it always worked out well that one baby would like stay asleep and not be ready to eat yet. So we were able to feed one, feed the other, and then the third. And we, for the first, I'd say five weeks at least, we always kept it that way. So there were instances where, you know, one or two babies were being woken up. And I know they say like, don't wake a sleeping baby. But once the train left the station, once we started feeding, like we had to feed them all. Otherwise we, that one hour of sleep would turn into 45 minutes or 30 minutes or no hours of sleep. So we just kind of tried to keep them all together and we still try to keep them all together. Now that they're three months old, one person is able to feed two at once and then the other mom can feed one and we kind of rotate. Another thing I didn't expect was breastfeeding to be so hard. We both anticipate breastfeeding, but it took so much longer because they were preemie and they were having latching issues and sucking issues that tired them out where they were used to a bottle in the NICU. So we started exclusively pumping since that was a little bit easier and less time consuming. But the pump became like the fourth child because you're feeding the three of them and then you're pumping right after or right before. And that it's still, I would say a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, for sure it's challenging and something to just note is that preemies aren't born with the natural suck reflex that a 40 week old baby would be. So it's a lot more work for them to eat at the breast. Although all of our babies latched wonderfully in the beginning, um, the, where they would drink for like 5, 10, 15 minutes, they wouldn't get a full feed because it was just a lot of work for them. So you would do like half a feed and then stop and bottle feed them. So we were spending a lot of time making sure that they got exactly what they needed, which was a little stressful with three of them and would take probably like 40 minutes per baby. And um, that's why we were sticking to the bottle so we could measure exactly how much they were eating and making sure they had what they needed. Now let's move on to where we are now. The babies are almost three months old. We are working really hard to extend the hours in between feedings. Right now we're working on just getting four hours between the nighttime feeds and the daytime feeds. I'd say the last two or three weeks we were doing great at four hours in between feeds at night and three hours in between feeds during the day. And then this week, um, because we're transitioning back to work in the next two weeks, we were like, all right, this is it. We need four hours between all feeds so that we can work and pump and sleep. Uh, so this is what we're working on this week. And so far, so good. I'm gonna knock on wood. Um, we're just trying to extend it as much as we can, but make sure that the babies are still getting what they need and growing. 
once we can consistently get them on the four hour feeds day and night that's a good indication that they're ready for their sleep training right now they're in our bedroom so we keep them close so that we can monitor them <laughs> Philo's talking we really like to move them into their cribs in the room next door to us and once they can keep sleeping and keep those feeds up we will feel more comfortable doing so yeah something great is that their doctor is always like over the moon excited about their progress they're just growing exponentially you want to say hi you say hi little willow <laughs> oh <laughs> and on that note, check back. We'll share a lot more about what's going on with the triplets. If there's anything you guys specifically want to know, we're really happy to share. So let us know in the comments and we'll see you soon.